Hello and welcome to So What You're Saying Is. I'm Peter Whittle. I hope you had a great summer. Now, since we started the show in January, there's been one name that viewers have suggested as a guest for our show, one name more than any others. So I'm very, very pleased that today I have with me the author, journalist and broadcaster, Peter Hitchens. Thank you very much, Peter. Pleasure so far. <laughs> you, uh, you have quite a dedicated following. It's lovely to, to know that. <laughs> but I noticed that uh, when you do uh, uh, Twitter, which you do quite prodigiously, uh, you've managed this amazing thing of actually getting about 72,000 followers and no, you follow nobody. How do you manage that? Well, I don't know. It's, it's, I didn't. I, the whole idea of following somebody is, is repugnant to me. So when right. I was offered the chance to do it, I didn't take it. So and then people started going on and on, on and on at me about how I didn't follow anybody. So it then became a matter of principle. <laughs> As for why people follow me, you have to ask them why they did, did that. Uh, I can't tell you. When you talk in, when you go to colleges to talk or universities or whatever. Uh, you know, I, I know that you, there's been some controversy around that. You've been, you know, like more and more people no platformed or disinvited. It's on more difficult because of the regulations which uh, student bodies impose on societies. Mm. And they often demand pledges of good behaviour on behalf of speakers, which no civilised person could conceivably give, so I just don't give them. Right. It makes it difficult sometimes. At, at Liverpool, I had, actually had to speak in the open air because we couldn't, uh, we couldn't find anywhere on the university premises where I was allowed to speak. It went off very well, actually. At open air speaking is, is a good exercise. And it was great fun for everybody, but these regulations are pestilential. And then there was the University of Portsmouth, which just dropped an invitation to me at short notice. And then, for some bizarre reason, imagine that having said I wasn't acceptable in that particular week, that I might come back some other week. <laughs> no, the no. I was not going to go back. What were you actually meant to be talking about I've on that forgotten. occasion? Right, okay. uh, what they were uh, uh, completely and utterly preoccupied with was, uh, was homosexuality, a subject on which I have fallen almost totally silent because there's yeah. no, it's one of those subjects about which there's absolutely no point in saying anything anymore. It's, it's, mm. it's just, you, you just can't argue rationally about it, so let's not bother. Mm. But when you do speak at those events, I mean, going back to the idea of people following you and you know, holding you in great esteem, do you ever find that people come up to you and, and their views have been changed by what you've said? Not that you are after that. I don't think people come up to me. I have had experiences of people who in, in combat have changed their minds in, as a result of argument, and people who've said that various books of mine have altered their way of thinking on some subjects. Uh, but that's why I, I wrote them. It's a rare thing for people to do this. Mm. And of course, it's it, the old Jonathan Swift rule always applies. You can't reason a man out of a position he wasn't reasoned into in the first place. And most people don't hold opinions because they were reasoned into them. They hold them for protective coloration or because it was what they were brought up with or yeah. what they saw on television. So you can't reason with them generally. In, in any case, people will often change their minds a long time after the event which caused the change of mind. That certainly happened with me. Mm. What are the instances with you? Oh, I, took a, I, was, a, I was a revolutionary socialist and mm. I ceased to be, but there was a very long period when I continued to be in, uh, outward and visible signs of revolutionary socialist, were, were, but within I was having severe doubts which I was fighting against because I knew as anybody who seriously changes his mind knows that as soon as I did it, I'd lose an awful lot of friends and become very unpopular. Life would become much more difficult and unpleasant. And it was easier not to even open the door that led to the staircase, that mm. led to the exit, that led to the change of mind. So you just, you, you, you hold a long way back mm. from the steps of doing it. And I understand this better than most people because I've done it. Do you think there's something different though now? Compared to say, like what well, you've just described there with yourself, if you take younger people now who may be at college, the, young, the people you may be talk to, whatever at events, go and speak at, um, it seems now that their views are held even more rigidly. It's not a rigidity. I was reasoned into my revolutionary position. I had been brought up as a traditional imperialist conservative. I grew up in a Navy family. I was one of the last people on earth to be educated in the traditional fashion about English history and the geography of the world and, and, and politics and all the other things that went with it. And I was persuaded out of it uh, by some very eloquent arguments, both listened to and read, and I changed my mind and became a revolutionary Marxist. 
and then I found that those arguments didn't hold up in practice. What's happened with the, the young of today is that they have been, I don't like to use uncomplimentary terms like brainwashed, but they have been brought up uh, to believe a set of opinions. They've been taught very systematically what to think, and mm. very seldom have they been taught how to think. And so the whole idea of being confronted with somebody who doesn't agree with them isn't just, it's, well, it's not a challenge or a, or, or, or a moment when you become curious. It's an outrage. Mm. Uh, how can anyone dare to believe these things which I've been taught from the very start are wrong? So they begin from that point of view. I'm quite impressed by the number of people who've escaped it or, or, or mm. who, who have actually managed to f find their way out of it. But I'm not surprised by it. And I'm, I'm in a sort of strange paradoxical way, sympathetic to the plight of the people who, who attack me. I, there is one particular person who writes to me from a very, very ferociously feminist point of view every few months. Absolute streams of, of vituperation and, and loathing. And, and I'm always extremely polite to her because I think that quite possibly the moment may come when actually she may be open to argument. And, and, and so why not? Mm. I sympathize. I, can, I, I know I, I, always, I always sympathize with people really, really taking on a point of view and arguing it to its logical conclusion with all the force at their command. What's wrong with that, mm. ever? But do you think, though, that when they are sort of so angry, you know, I think it's Melanie Phillips once said this to me, why, why, would, they get, why would they get so angry? It's because they might feel that you are right? Or well, people, the, the main reason, and again, I have personal experience of this, the main reason I feel we get angry in arguments is because they hear somebody expressing their own suppressed mm. doubts. Mm. And that is the most guaranteed way of infuriating someone, I think, just saying something which they, they, they've sort of suspected might be so, but they would never ever admit to saying. And, they, and, they, and as a result, they don't really have any defense against it. Mm. So you can tell when they, t they will turn nasty at that point, and you can tell you've struck mm -hmm. a blow. It's, so it's, when it happens, it's quite satisfying. Also, isn't it just on this point as well, when, when you say that people, young people now, have not come across disagreement. At the same time, also there is, is there not this sense in which these are the views that a good person has, i.e. that if you don't have them, you're wicked in some way? Yes, well, it's a sort of extension beyond, um, beyond Calvinism and, and Lutheranism of, of justification by faith alone, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, yeah. we, we are made good by our opinions rather than by our actions. Yes. And, so it's not a new idea that people might think that, but it used to be you had to have the right religious opinions, now you have yeah. to have the right political opinions, many of which are, in essence, religious. Yeah. And opinions which people have, particularly about global warming, are almost indistinguishable, it seems to me, from religious opinions. Mm. It appears sometimes that there is this kind, well, you've more said Lutheran, but, but this sort of sense in which I am a virtuous person. Yeah, know, by holding this is obvious. Things. I mean, so many opinions are held for the purpose of virtue. I, I, I don't imagine any of us are guiltless of this, of publicly espousing an opinion in the hope that people will think that we're better than we are as a result of it. Uh, it's, it it's all part of the general state of sin in which we find ourselves, in which we want people to believe that we are better than we are. So I'm not, again, I don't find this particularly surprising. I just think it's important to be able to tell it apart uh, from a serious argument. Mm. So if someone starts saying, I, I want to intervene in Syria because, um, because I'm really outraged by the terrible humanitarian misdeeds of the Syrian government, well, the humanitarian misdeeds of the Syrian government are indeed appalling. Uh, but it, it's to, to make that a justification for, for dropping more bombs on Syria than have already been dropped on it, it seems to me to be pretty far-fetched. And so what we're really doing when we say things like this is we're saying, look at me, yeah. how good I am, I want to intervene. And instead of calling down thunderbolts and the anger of the Lord uh, on the Assad state, uh, what you want to call down is cruise missiles and uh, the bombs of the US Navy. Uh, but it's the same sort of thing, isn't mm. it? Mm. it has a, it's fundamentally very, very similar to, to, to that sort of religious behavior. And it, it doesn't actually confer any virtue. And we all know as we get older, there's only one form of virtue, and that's, uh, that's fundamentally self-sacrifice mm. and self-reform, which you have to do in private anyway. With, uh, if you take, again, this, these sort of received opinions, or the p opinions that the young have, or younger people have, if you like, that they tend to have en bloc, um, this revolves very much around identity politics, doesn't it, really? 
It's the I don't really. I've, I hear the phrase, uh, but I'm not entirely sure what it means. Well, isn't it where basically somebody is you know, increasingly defined by one characteristic? Or you know? there, oh, there is some of that. Uh, and some people obviously find some solace in that. Mm. Yeah, but again, who can blame them? It's a, it's a lonely, frightening world if you can find some place where you've got comradeship and solidarity and, and something which makes you feel less alone and more important. Who can blame people for that? I don't. But at the same time, don't you think it sort of, it, it rather sort of cuts society, maybe class once cut society horizontally, and, now, identity points cut it vertically almost, don't they? Well, yes, I suppose it does, yes. But again, if you, want to, if, if you want to create loyalties, then you need to have groups of people who feel distinct from other people who will be loyal. And mm. that's uh, in, in the nature of politics. You find groups uh, which you hope uh, you can recruit to your cause and, mm. and, and, and identify with. It's just another another way in which it's been been done in a society in which obviously the old class distinctions, which used to be so important mm. in politics, have dissolved into something completely different. So I, it's not it, it doesn't disturb me particularly. I think there's a, the uh, academic John Gray wrote a piece this week uh, when he was talking about the humanities in universities and how they were now basically because of the march of identity politics, because of the kind of restriction. That essentially the humanities were beyond, you know, beyond help. Well, everything's beyond help. That's not a great. Uh, that's not a great discovery, as far as I can say. We live. Uh, this is the really ridiculous thing about the modern West. We live in post-revolutionary societies, and in most cases, we don't even realise the revolution is taking place. It's been the Kierkegaardian revolution, in which all the buildings remain standing, but everything which uh, which led to their being built and contributed to their design and the whole society which supported them has been wiped away. And people walk around in it, it's still relatively prosperous, thinking a revolution must mean a red flag flying over the mm. post office and the barracks and the railway station and commissars in the streets. It doesn't. Uh, modern left-wing revolution means this. It means the, the policing of thought, the, the deadening of, uh, of, of the academy, uh, the lack of serious debate or understanding, the suppression of disagreement. And everybody accepts it, and you're surrounded by it, and there is no, there is no cure for it. It's all gone. Education's dead. Most of the media is dead. It's almost unwatchable. Most of, the, mm. most of what is put out now, on, particularly on BBC television, it's almost impossible for an intelligent person to sit and watch it. But luckily for them, the number of intelligent, educated people watching it is very small, so they get away with it. Mm. Would Would you say, therefore, that, that younger people who, given this might be the case, young people should go off themselves, circumvent university, go off and find the classics themselves? Well, my advice themselves? to the young in this country is to leave the country, but that's, that, that's and, and people laugh when I say it, but I, I'm, I've, I've never been more serious in my life. And they say, where shall I go? I say, I don't care where you go. It's not, I'm a travel agent. It's not up to me. The point about this country is that it's in the, in the foothills of such a catastrophe that it's not a good idea to wait around and find out what it's like. If I, if I were 30, I'd go myself, but I can't, uh, I don't believe you can go and live in someone else's country unless you can support yourself. Mm. It's too late for me to learn how to do that, so I'm stuck with whatever is to come. I just hope I die naturally before somebody breaks into my house and beats me to death for, 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 um, for, for whatever I happen to have in my wallet, which you know, is just a race between the one and the other for me. You have called yourself Britain's obituarist. Yes. I mean, is that an ongoing obituary? Well, I keep writing these books, which are which amount. I, I, I've gone to my publishers and says, "Look, can we put it all together in one whopping great Dominic Sandbrook style breeze block sized volume right. and call it the Obituary of Britain?" Which I think is a great idea, but they haven't taken me up on it. Yet. <laughs> but could be it could be it could could have a cover completely black except for the words "The Obituary of Britain" in in, in white and lovely eighteenth century lapidary script. But uh, no, they haven't taken me up on that. But no, every, every, everything I write is another chapter of the mm. obituary. Mm. I Death was pronounced long ago. But when you first started writing about it, Oh, I didn't think that. When I first started writing about this, I, I, I deluded myself into thinking it might make some difference. Right up to 2010, I thought I could make some difference in this country. And, then after and that, what, was, what happened then? Well, I believed in the, I suppose, six or seven years before 2010, that the, the most important thing that conservatives in this country could conceivably do would be to destroy the Conservative and Unionist Party, mm. which was the principal obstacle to conservative politics. 
And I tried to persuade people that David Cameron offered no hope of any kind and that indeed if the Conservative Party could, could get back into government, it would be the loss of the great opportunity. It had, it had at that stage lost so many elections in a row that one more and it would have fallen apart and yeah. it would have ceased to attract any financial contributions. And as a result, there would have had to be a rethink among conservative-minded people about what sort of party they wanted. And we could have actually had a political party which was genuinely patriotic and, uh, and genuinely conservative morally and socially. And I couldn't get anybody. I approached other columnists, I approached people in politics, I, I, I had endless arguments with my readers about it. I wrote in my, my newspaper and said, whatever you do, in 2010, do not vote Conservative. Uh, they can't win, which they couldn't. They couldn't have done in 2010. Mm. In fact, uh, there's nothing to be lost, and you'd be far better off enduring another five years of Gordon Brown than saving the Conservative Party from its deserved doom. And nobody paid the slightest bit of attention. I feel since then that my warnings have been entirely vindicated. Mm. And everybody hates the Conservative Party now, even more than I did then, and f with very good reason. And it has proved to be a disastrous thing, and we've got nowhere as a, as a result of it. And all that time has been lost mm. when we might conceivably have reversed uh, the cultural, social, and moral revolution. And as far as I'm concerned, I'm relieved of responsibility. I have no political engagement now. I just sit back and laugh. I think the whole thing is very funny. When though you look at the picture, whether it's Britain's long death or the Conservative Party, I just want on a personal level, um, can you still separate it from yourself or does it actually make you sad? Does it make you... Well, it used to make me terribly sad because I used to think I could do something about it. But once you recognise that it's just a, it, it's just a, a comedy of, of morons hurling themselves off high buildings and, and diving under buses and things like that, then you just watch and you laugh. You know, it, 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 is, it is actually quite funny. Mm. Uh, and it's easier to understand once you realise that none of the people involved understand what they're doing or have any clue as to what the long-term results of, of, what they're, of what they're up to. The European Union, for instance, let's not get into that, but my friend Christopher Booker, who very sadly died yes. recently, yeah. uh, was at the end of his life in something near to despair about the inability of people on the supposed political right to understand the issues. Uh, in, in, in which they were embroiled. Mm. I feel much the same way. It is, as I say, it is, it is comical. Uh, and there was, I don't know whether you've ever read Claude Coburn's masterwork of, of uh, autobiography, I, Claude, there's a wonderful moment during some catastrophic international conference in the 1930s when it's clear that everything is finished and that nothing lies ahead but doom. One of the journalists turns to another and says, well, in between the crisis and the catastrophe, we may as well have a glass of champagne. That is my motto. <laughs> in the 1980s, maybe, when you maybe still thought that, for example, you know, the Conservative Party had hope, say, um, isn't the point that if you look back at, say, the Thatcher years, um, there was virtually no, what you might call broadly cultural activity at all. It, it, no. it was all economic, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, well it, was, it, well, it was, it was economics and foreign policy. Yeah. What did it for me, I was suspicious about the economics. I didn't, I didn't think that it was, I wasn't, uh, I'm really a social democrat and I'm quite sympathetic to a, a lot of social democracy and I didn't, like a lot of what was going on and particularly was worried by what appeared to be the destruction of industry. But I did feel that the Cold War position was right and I did feel that, she, as I was an industrial correspondent for a lot of the period, I did feel that she understood better than most people that there was a genuine uh, infiltration of British politics by, by the Communist Party which is much more important than most people mm. realised then or understand now. And on those things I was completely with her. And when it came to yes or no, then it was yes rather than no for those reasons. But no, it was, it, was, it, was, it was culturally completely void. There was nothing, and morally completely void. There was nothing, and educationally as well. What an opportunity to mm. reverse Circular 1065 and not a thing done, not a single new grammar school uh, re created, not a single old one restored, not even the direct grant system brought back to life, nothing, a blank. You see, this is one. Uh, I know you've written a lot about education. But I'm, I'm a, from a grammar school. Um, there's been this kind of very half-hearted movement, hasn't it, in, the, in recent years? That was a form of grammar school should come back or whatever. But it seems that, frankly, it, it, it does seem that very half-hearted. Oh, it's, it's, it's no-hearted. It has. It, it never. 
it never comes to anything, and I know it never will whenever I hear them say it, because they, they, don't, they, they don't really mean it. You can't actually uh, just have a piecemeal recreation of academic selection. It has to be done as a, as a direct national policy, encouraged ferociously by a, a committed government. Mm. Uh, rather than a few token supposed grammar schools in a few areas, that that merely distorts it, as you see in, in counties such as, as Kent and Buckinghamshire, which are close to London in commuter areas. You simply get a f very small number of besieged grammar schools, which are not uh, simply are not typical of, of how grammar schools would operate in the national system, no. and actually become in themselves an argument against selection yes. because short-sighted, ignorant, or or, or 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 frankly malicious people. Uh, portray this situation as if it is what it would be if we had a national selective yeah, system, yeah, which we yeah. don't. So I'm not interested in any of that. I, I was. It, I, I always thought it was terribly funny when Theresa May came out supposedly as the friend of the ground schools because I outed her some years ago as uh, in her in reference books. She either didn't mention her education, her, her school education at all, or she claimed to have gone to comprehensive, when in fact what she went to was a grammar school that was turned into a comprehensive while she was there. Right, uh, and, and and then to, to make herself out to be the apostle of the grammar schools when she's hid the fact that she'd been to one, yeah. seemed to me to be a bit much. I think I remember when my school went from being grammar to comprehensive. It was under Shirley Williams. It would have been about nineteen seventy-seven. You survived quite late in that. Yes, yeah. but there was a real sense amongst people because it was like I'd say half middle class, half working class on the whole yeah. of the school. There was a real sense of fear and outrage. Why is this happening? Why are you? T taking a school, why are you going to destroy it, basically? Well, quite. And a, a, and a lot of people have this experience. And the, there is actually an account of what happened to Theresa May's school, which was Holton Park Girls Grammar outside Oxford, when it was merged with the nearby secondary modern, and the, 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 the changes for the worse, which immediately and visibly happened. There are a lot of, in local histories, a lot of accounts of these, of, of schools which, are, which had, in many cases, for centuries, it's been at the heart of communities and yeah, they've yeah. been excellent schools because of the kind of schools they were, where no fees were charged and where anybody who could, who, could, who, could, who could pass the test could go. These schools just being smashed to pieces in a few short years and, and, and turned into caricatures of education and nobody could do anything about it. Everyone was powerless because the central decision had been taken and it was going to be implemented come what may. But this extraordinary thing was that it really, they really were, that educational system as it was then, really was having an effect, wasn't it, on social mobility? Oh, in all really respect, you, you can see there is, there is one set of statistics which is available in the, the Franks report into Oxford University in the, in the middle 1960s, uh, which shows that the number of, of, of entrants to Oxford from grammar schools and their very close cousins, direct grants, had been going up steadily since 1944. And on, this, on extrapolation, it would probably have hit the 70s by now without any yeah. aid, to the yeah. special, no special provision, no, uh, no concessions made. They would just have got there and pushed aside the products of the, of the, uh, of the public schools as they were doing. And, and anybody who was there at the time will tell you that there was this revolution going on. Mm. And uh, I went to Plate Glass University in the early 70s, and I was surrounded by young bright working class mm. young men and women for, with the same grammar school province. I checked the figures a, a couple of years ago and it was so, it was as I imagined it had been and then within a very few years after, after the, the comprehensiveization began, the, the number of private school entrants began to rise and the number of comprehensive school entrants who of course came from comprehensives in well-off areas began to rise and those, those young men and women who I saw were the last to have that chance. You Go see on. this now reflected in areas that were always traditionally very meritocratic, such as journalism, for example. Oh yeah, you do. But it, it's though, in fact, journalism still has some roots up for the non, mm. um, because it's a trade, not a profession. There are still some roots, and, and uh, most of the, of the really distinguished reporters, and particularly in the areas of news, in journalism, have not come through graduate trainee schemes, but have come up for, out of the, out of the graduate schools straight into the newsroom. Mm. people and, I, and, and it, it's it, it's still just but but of course the grammar schools which used to feed them in have largely gone so this is rarer and rarer. The thing is we're talking about the structural you know the way that the system was actually uh, uh, structured at that time uh, the crisis in education that we're maybe now having the effects of was not just about that was it it's sort of schools in a way changed they didn't they didn't see their role as 
passing on anything anymore. Well, that, that, uh, th- there were several, as with almost all changes, there's no, there's no single cause. Mm. And the thing which overwhelmed the grammar schools, and in fact a lot of the secondary moderns, which, were, which are now much calumniated and were much better in many cases than they're thought to have been, uh, was the great, what, what we called in this country the baby bulge. It's now a, a term that's been overwhelmed by the American term baby boom. But it, it began to f- feed into the schools, uh, about the secondary schools, in the middle 50s. And what was really needed was a large program of opening new grammar schools and indeed new secondary moderns as well to cope the capacity, but nobody did that. And so the, 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 the system was overwhelmed by numbers. Mm. And the, the Conservative Party at the time was not particularly ideologically committed to grammar schools because so many of its senior figures sent their children to private schools and mm. they didn't really understand or care. And the Labour Party was going through a, an egalitarian spasm, which was making it more and more hostile to them. So they, they were basically left unex, unexpanded. In the early 50s, the, for instance, the, the, the Gurney-Dixon report records, I think, that, that two-thirds of children in grammar schools in England and Wales were from working class homes. Mm-hmm. You would not find anything no. remotely resembling that in the so-called good comprehensives of today. But it was so. But it was the it was the bulge and the numbers which overwhelmed it, and the unwillingness of a, of a not particularly intelligent or sensible government to do anything about it, and all kinds of sins followed from that. But we could spend an entire afternoon discussing. The no, but I mean, this is the root of everything, really. Isn't it? It's Education. the root of a lot. The, but the other root of everything is, of course, the decline of the uh, the decline of the married family and a mm. stable family life, mm. particularly among the poor. Mm. Uh, which which got going shortly afterwards, and which I did deal with at, at, at some length in my 1999 book, The Abolition of Britain, but it is it, it, it remains the other great revolution. Uh, because, of course, both these, the education and the family revolution, both affect the young, completely transform upbringing, education, and, uh, and socialization. So you, you have a completely different kind of person that grows up in the, yes. the country in, in which they live from what came before. And knowing nothing about the country as well? Increasingly now, yes. Uh, or knowing things about it which are misleading in my case. And I think that, they, that you often find that people have been, have been taught a version of the past which is, is so partial that they can't really understand properly what it is that went before what they now see. On this p- point as well, um, Obviously, you were very politically active in the 60s, weren't you, and then the 70s? I, yeah, I, I, began, I, I began, I suppose, I could call it politically active, really, after about 68. After about 68. Before that, I was just a troublemaker. If you, if, if you take that, that period as being, if you like, the start, maybe, or, or round about the start of what you would call the Cultural Revolution? That's oh, no, it had begun well before that. Right, right. And it, in many ways, it has its roots in, in the First World War. And, uh, in th- and before that, in the Bloomsbury group and the Fabian Society, mm. so it, it's the ideas that it th- th- that eventually came to pass in the fifties and sixties, whether they be Edmund Leach's attack on marriage or or the the growing desire for comprehensive education on the left or. Uh, the sexual revolution, mm. these were being espoused by people such as Roy Jenkins mm. and Anthony Crossland in the late 50s and were beginning to come to pass in, in the 1960s. The thing about the 1960s, the really the high 60s as I call them, right at the end, 68, 69, 70, is that people went further in that period than, than, than they'd ever gone before and indeed a lot further than they were prepared to go in the years afterwards. 1973, the, the oil shock, the Yom Kippur War and what followed it, put a stop to it all and, and chilled things uh, down quite a bit. So th- it, it took a very long time for us to get back uh, in terms of cultural revolution to, t- to the really frenzied levels that they were at in, in, in the late 60s, which were often in rather isolated places like university campuses and parts of the capital city and little you know, corners of culture like BBC Two and so forth. But they then became enormous. And, and general, but it wasn't. It hadn't just begun out of nothing in no, the no, sixties. No, no. There were an awful lot of ideas which had been been seething. But of course, the the, the advent of, of television, and the which was in many cases domin- particularly under Hugh Carlson Green at the BBC, dominated by people with sort of Fabian 
Bloomsbury radical ideas uh, meant that instead of just having the Bloomsbury group uh, talking to each other in, in, in mm. novels that nobody read mm. and in gatherings in, 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 in London's s squares, the Bloomsbury group suddenly gained control of the national transmitters and were able through, what a thought. able through, well, I mean, particularly, <laughs> through, particularly through drama, and yeah, the yeah, Wednesday yeah. plays and the, and, and, the, and, and all the, 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 the and, and of course through the supposed satire programs, that was the week that was, and so on and so forth, to, pro, to project onto a much larger number of minds ideas which were, had previously been restricted to a very small number of intellectuals. Would you say that, uh, Actually, you talk about the Bloomsbury Group, it's interesting. You know, you've, if you go back that far, you, you had Gramsci or whatever in the 1920s. But by the 1960s, this had become this, this slogan of the long march through the institutions, hadn't it? Well, Gramsci is, a, is an interesting thing because he, he, he was one of the very earliest people on the revolutionary left to understand that the Soviet experiment had been a disaster. Mm. He went there, he saw it was a catastrophe, he came back, he told his comrades in the Italian Communist Party, this is not, we can't get anywhere like this, we, if, it, it's, it's doomed to fail, it's a millstone around our necks, if we're to make any real progress, what isn't necessary is, he didn't use this term, but is, is, a, is a cultural and moral revolution, so that the people who we're trying to preach to will be more receptive to our ideas, but as things happen, the conservative, prosperous, Christian working classes of Europe will not ever mm. uh, buy Bolshevism as an idea, in which he was absolutely right. And that's why he became so important, because he, 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 his idea of hegemony and his idea of taking over the, the ideas of society uh, was, was one which became very appealing to the, the new left in the universities in mm. the 1960s. And they had the ideas, and then they met Gramsci, I think, rather than the other way around. Right. And he became a sort of right. flagship. But uh, this, is, uh, this is coincidental, really, that the, the Bloomsbury's and the, the, the Fabians, who uh, had their own ideas about overthrowing the, the, the mores and, and system of society, uh, working in a sort of almost blind way towards a similar destination. They all come together in the 1960s as a series of forces. I think it was, uh, it was, it was um, one of the German revolutionaries who actually came up. That's it was indeed, yes. Was it Dutschke on the term, the, 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 yes. the, the term of the, the long march? Uh, it wasn't Gramsci, but it's associated with him. But there has undoubtedly been a lot. Well, yes, but this is this is the interesting point. You know, well, I was on it, right? And when I set out, in, in, when I first went into journalism, I was fully intending to 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 gain the necessary skills to to uh, to spread the revolutionary message through through newspapers and the media. That was what I was intending to do. Quite but a lot of your that, friends. That was my that was my intention. I think I was more focused than most people. I, most of the, I mean, it's extraordinary how many members of Blair's cabinet were actually members of, of, mm. of Trotsky's or communist organizations that we know about. And I suspect there were probably more who, who, we, who we don't know about. But I, because I was a member of a revolutionary organization, I was more focused, uh, more conscious of what I was doing. But mm. our ideas spread very, very widely. When I was at the University of York in the 1970s, we, we became, in the period when I was there, we became the dominant political organization on campus. If people wanted to talk about left-wing politics, it was to the international socialists they turned. Uh, they came to our meetings, they read our publications, they listened to what they managed to join. Mm. And I don't believe that they ceased to be in favor of, of, of some sort of revolution when they went off into the world. I think they continued to be, and, but they'd learnt through the processes that we all we all learn about life, uh, that you don't do this by selling the socialist worker on the street or going yeah. on marches or picket lines. You do it by the slow, gradual process of inserting yourself into society and making yourself influential. And about 25, 30 years after we all left university, there we were, all in mm -hmm. position. And in many cases, livid that the, that the political government of the country was in the hands of what was formerly a conservative party, which is one of the reasons for the sort of red glow revolutionary sensation when the, when the Blair government was elected. It was, mm, it was, mm. uh, all the left-wing people I knew behaved as, as if there'd been a red dawn. Mm. They were completely overwhelmed mm. by this. I just thought it was silly. But the, the, I didn't realize at the time that they were actually right. <laughs> What's yes. red dawn? There was a very, uh, I remember Matthew Paris of all people, 
saying, this was uh, in one of his columns around the time that during the Blair thing, that there was something sort of slightly, he put it alien about them. I, I uh, think meaning there was something that just did not feel like before. Well, it wasn't like before. I, Matthew was often very perceptive uh, because he does allow himself to think. But the, the, what, what I had been told by, I say who it is now because he, he, he subsequently died, uh, it's called Philip Bassett. He, he'd been an industrial correspondent as, as I had been, and we were, we'd been good friends. But he suddenly announced a f few months before the 1907 election he was going off to work for Blair. And we, we realized after this we were not going to be able to have much to do with each other because it was going to be, a, if not an actual friendship buster, it was going yeah. to cool things. So we went for a drink together. And as it were, part on good terms. At the end of it he said, you have no idea how extensive mm. the Blair project is and how deep it is. And then a few years later, a, a character called Peter Hyman, who was very close to Blair, wrote an article in The, in the Observer quite recently, actually, which I often quote, saying that Blairism was far more revolutionary and, uh, and radical than Jeremy mm. Corbyn, that again, it was an enormous project to change the country, and I think it was. And nobody really understood at the time just how extensive it was, including probably Blair himself, who although it emerged a few years ago, uh, had actually been a, a, a Trotskyist at university, which if that had come out at the time would have destroyed him, but now nobody cares. Uh, I, I don't think Blair fully understood it because he wasn't very bright, but a lot of the people around him understood this was an enormous moment in, in history in which the, the actual, the thinking, I would say Marxist, because probably in most cases they, it would it would narrow them to call them that. The thinking radical left had finally got their hands on the leaders of power, mm. uh, in a, in, of political power as well as cultural power, and as well as broadcasting power, as well as educational power, and they were in a position to change the country, and they did, and they changed the, they changed economically as well as uh, as well as culturally. A huge amounts of. of uh, of, uh, of money was shifted from one place to another by Gordon Brown in ways which which did transform society, which people un underestimate, as well as all the cultural and moral stuff. I think as well that... that uh, it was a revolution. Yes. Uh, it's interesting as well that there was this moment, wasn't there, which was, I think, uh, it was not intentional, but uh, the, one of um, Blair's speech writers, Andrew Neither, right, pointed out that oh, there had been this real attempt to have social consequences from mass migration yeah, he, well, he to change. Yeah, he said that there had been this, that there had been this discussion. He, mm. he, he just outed it in, a, in an article in the Evening Standard, and the, which has ever afterwards been a terrible embarrassment. It was one of those moments, a bit like the Peter Hyman uh, mm. article in the Observer, where, where for once people spoke directly of what it, of what it was that, 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 that had been going on, uh, rather than leaving us to work it out. And I think it's 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 an interesting revelation because just of just how explicit it was, but who can doubt it? I mean, when I was a revolutionary socialist, for instance, we were very much in favour of large-scale immigration, not because we particularly liked immigrants, but because we thought we didn't like Britain. Yes, exactly. And we point. thought that if we had yeah. large numbers of people in Britain who were who, who, who from outside, it would make it our task of, of changing the country easier. And it makes it's 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 rational. It makes perfect sense. And it would make perfect sense in a new Labour context as well. So for Andrew neither to have said that as he did was, uh, and I've often, I've done what I can to give it the widest possible circulation, because it seems to me to be a very, very interesting historical document. It's, it's a huge thing, but also, as you say, at the time, actually, considering what was being said, remarkably underreported, actually. Well, things are, I, I was just mentioning this, when, 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 when Blair told Peter Hennessy on Radio 4, yes, I was a Trotskyist at university, Nobody reported it except me. Mm. Nobody. Mm. I mean, by any standards, that's an interesting thing, isn't it? Mm. Mm. But not a word. Mm. It's extraordinary. I, some things, d you mustn't assume that just because something hasn't been reported, it hasn't happened. No. You mentioned there about, I mean, I find it fascinating you're talking about actually you wanted to go in to one of our institutions, if you like, the media or whatever, and you wanted to spread the word. Uh, if you look at the kind of, if you look at the, our, the cultural output now, and, and how plays, we mentioned films, whatever. Um, I've noticed that in your column, uh, in the Mail on Sunday, you mentioned films quite a lot. Uh, I, I wanted to ask you really, first of all, do you avoid now looking at certain things because you know it's just going to make you angry because of the subliminal messages? 
or actually, I mean, are, are you a great film man? I mean, I, I speak as one who, who is. I, I'm a great. Well, I, I love going to the cinema, though. I'm usually you, disappointed. No, you, but you keep going. Actually, I've noticed that you do actually write. Well, there's a very a simple reason for that, though. What's that? Well, you try illustrating a political column. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but do you actually and a film always provides you with a note? You can say something. There's always something interesting to be said about a film, and yes. usually it produces a, a, a good, attractive illustration. But it, uh, it, it and, and it, it solves that problem. That's all. It has no. It's, it's 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 no more complicated than that. But do you find you actually sort of like? Do you bother now? For example, I'm talking about the results maybe of the culture of it. Do you bother with the theatre? Do you bother with? Well, I'm not a Londoner, so the theatre is 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 is, is, sort of, is such an expedition. I can't really mm. be bothered most of the time. Mm. Uh, it's too far to go. It's it's a night. I suppose the point really I'm making is that the drama or plays or films they tend, if anything, now to just to parrot the orthodoxies of the establishment on the whole. Well, yeah, that could be fun sometimes, though, can't I mean, some of them are quite, David Hare's quite good some of the mm. time. I don't, um, I remember going to see Pravda years and years ago when the National Theatre was new and, and laughing at the wrong bit. I was the only person, I was the, probably the only person who actually worked in Fleet Street in the, th in the theatre and somebody <laughs> said something. It was actually very funny, but it was only funny if you knew Fleet Street mm. and, I, and, and it was funny in quite a conservative way and I laughed and everybody in the theatre turned and stared at me. <laughs> <laughs> but but no, I, some 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 of the, the the as it were the radical playwrights are quite are quite mm, good mm. and uh, and enjoyable in their own. But I just don't because I'm not a Londoner. Going to the theatre is something which I don't do all that much of. I, I, the there are wonderful sometimes performances of Shakespeare in the courtyard of the Body and in Oxford where I live, which is architecturally exactly of the time of the plays, yes, completely yes. perfect. Which I will go to, and increasingly when I go to Shakespeare, I take the text. Right, uh, because it adds so much to it, but uh, and that I will still enjoy. And also, the, the other luxury of Oxford is that an awful lot of open air Shakespeare in the College Gardens, which is another great luxury. But going to the theatre, as such, as I say, is a Londoner's thing. I don't really do it. Being Britain's obituarist, to go back to that point, um, I think I have sort of asked you this, but you know, when you go on with your life now, you, you can you still enjoy? Your Britain, is it one? No, I don't. The, the, it's not a question of enjoying my Britain. I'm a very fortunate person by the standards of most people, and I live a very fortunate life, which I won't go into in any great detail, but I'm, for the moment, relatively insulated from an awful lot of the things which are happening mm. uh, to other, uh, to my countrymen and countrywomen. Uh, but it doesn't, the fact that I am fortunate doesn't blind me to the fact that most people are not. Mm. Uh, and if it did for a moment, then the, the letters and the telephone calls and the emails that I get from people in the more blighted parts of the country all the time would very quickly remind me that I of just how fortunate I am and how untypical my experience is. Well, there are those people, those followers again, coming back to you. Um, Peter, thank you very, very much for coming and uh, talking to us. And uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank well, thank you, thank you for having me. Thank you very much indeed. Um, that's it for so what you're saying is this week and please remember to subscribe won't you and uh, we'll see you next time thank you